Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick, and I will talk today about electricity theft. Who of you has heard about electricity theft before? Raise your hand. You know, sometimes I ask another question in a conference, and I ask, who of you has actually stolen electricity? And then some people still raise their hand. But what is, actu <clears throat> what is actually electricity theft? You can see this up here, and that's what it literally looks like in the real life. People steal electricity by, for example, manipulating infrastructure or by not going through a meter, just, you know, plugging to some power lines, whatever. And it's a big issue, and in my project, we work on detecting that in emerging markets, for example, in Brazil, where electricity theft is a real issue. And I work at the University of Luxembourg, and usually when you do PhD in a university, it's very theoretical, very boring. But at the University of Luxembourg, we work very closely with companies. So we get real data. In this case, we get real data from utilities in Latin America, and we finally build um, outcomes that really work in practice, and it's not just theoretical work in publications. So, what does electricity theft look like? For example, like this. People manipulate meters. There's one trick, you, you know, in the past you had these very big meters at home, in your basement, these huge boxes. One way to make that meter not work is you just put a huge magnet on it and then it records less because there's this spinning wheel. I'm, I'm not giving any advice to you on how to steal. It's, I'm just telling you what's frequently being done. But you can do other stuff too, like you can see here. People manipulate transformers or other infrastructure outside. So the theft may not happen only in the building by bypassing a meter. It can also happen outside. And it's a big issue. If you go to Brazil, India, Pakistan, and so forth, that's about 40% of the total electricity distributed. So about half of the electricity distributed gets stolen. When I saw that number for the first time, I thought it was actually a typo. But it's really 40%. And in some areas, it's 100%, you know, in some parts of cities. But in, like Brazil, the overall average, it's about 40% of the total electricity distributed. Before I tell you about this project, I will tell you about myself. So I'm doing a PhD at the University of Luxembourg, together with a partner company from Brazil that gives us all the data from utilities that we work with in Brazil. Um, I also spent some time in Montreal at the university there. Uh, Montreal is now a big hub for artificial intelligence, and my co-advisor works there, so I spent some time there during my PhD. Uh, in the past, I studied at Imperial College London, and before that, I worked at CERN. So CERN is in Geneva, Switzerland. It's the European Organization for Nuclear Research with these big part particle accelerators, and I also worked there on machine learning in the past. And now I want to ask you, what do you think who actually steals? For example, let's go to Brazil. What do you think who typically would steal? Yes? Organizations, like what type of organizations? Yeah, Bitcoin miners or you know, truck, you know, truck farms, whatever. You, they actually do. Um, that, that's true. But first of all, we may think it's poor people who steal, who just cannot afford to pay for electricity. And yes, they do steal, but if you have a few poor families, they steal. Overall, it doesn't hurt too much because they don't consume much. It gets worse if big factories steal, and yes, they do. If you go to Brazil, the, um, industry is a big thief, and this hurts much more if you have a big factory that steals than if you have just a few poor people that steal. But there's another thing. The government steals too, because these utilities are, they are private. So the public hand steals too. My data shows me that in Rio de Janeiro, about every second police station actually steals. So you have a real problem, you know, uh, if you even cannot trust the government. Like, I'm, I'm from Central Europe, so people just cannot imagine that the government would actually steal, but it's an issue. 
I want to say electricity theft also probably happens here in Central Europe, but to such a small amount that you would have to invest much more to detect the thieves than you would actually get back. So the, the theft is a very small issue here. It's a big issue in emerging markets. And I have given this talk a lot of times. I gave this talk last year. There was a, a guy from Nigeria, and he actually shared a lot of advice how he steals back at home. So when, you, when I give this talk, I sometimes meet very interesting people. Um, and we. Another thing is, what are the losses, actually? I said it's 40% in some countries here in Germany. It's maybe 1% or less. But overall, what's the losses all around the world? It's about 100 billion US dollars per year all around the globe. So that's a lot of money. We don't know what 100 billion is. If you try to quantify it, you could buy 20 aircraft carriers with that amount of money. Remember, the US only has 10 or 11 at the moment. So 100 billion US dollars is a lot of money. And it's not just the actual direct financial losses to the utilities. There are also other damages to the infrastructure, like if people start stealing and they don't do proper insulation of the power lines, their house may just burn down, and neighbors' houses may also burn down. So this causes a lot of further damage to the infrastructure. And we work on detecting electricity theft using machine learning. So what we do is we get data from the utilities. For example, consumption data. And what we can see here is, for example, we have monthly meter readings. So every step here on the x-axis is a month. And assume this customer's consumption is read out once a month. And we see there was a high consumption and suddenly a big drop, which persisted over a longer time. And then this customer got inspected, which is uh, denoted by this vertical bar. And we see a fraud was found, a manipulation of the meter, and it was removed. And finally, the consumption goes back to the previous level. So we could say, suddenly, there's a big drop. That could be a theft. But what if someone just moved out of this house? So we could say, what about a longer drop? Yeah, maybe no one moved into that house again. So the consumption is still low. So we need more data than just the consumption, for example, where the customer lives, the type of customer, the meter type. Maybe some meters are more likely to be, to be manipulated than others. And we take all of this into account. And we have very high dimensional data, so we don't understand the data necessarily anymore. It's hard for us to say what's theft, what is not. But some customers get inspected, as I said here. And then we can use machine learning, where we feed in all the data about customers consumption, location, and so forth. And we have the results of inspections. And then we use machine learning to learn what makes fraud and what does not make fraud. And machine learning is very amazing, because you have computers that learn from examples. So we give examples of customers that we know they steal, others that we know they don't steal, because we have carried out inspections. And then we learn, and we can predict for all the other customers if they should be inspected. The problem is every wrong prediction we make, because we make predictions in order to say which customer should get inspected. And typically, in AI or machine learning, people say, well, we make a wrong prediction. It's not that bad as long as, long as we still do very well in lots of other cases. Here, it really hurts because we can only send out a certain number of inspections every month, because we have a s simply a number of technicians that we can send out. And every inspection costs a lot of money, because you have to send people there. So inspections really cost a lot of money. That's what we do, but there's one big challenge. Everyone is now talking about bias, saying an AI is biased, or a machine learning system is biased. But what, what does it really mean? We have some customers inspected, and that's the training data. So we say customers were inspected, we found fraud or not. And that data, that training data that we use for machine learning, follows some distribution. But we only have a very small amount of customers inspected, maybe 10% of our customers. But what if these 10% are not representative for all the other customers? And we want to test on all the other customers in order to say who to inspect. That's the test data. And if that data is 
follows a different distribution than the training data, then we have a problem. And that's what a bias means. Your data was, or your model was trained on data that is not representative for the overall distribution. And uh, we have found some ways to conquer this, to make our models more representative. Because yes, past inspections, they were carried out in a biased way. For example, some inspections may have focused on a certain neighborhood or a certain city, whereas other cities uh, didn't get inspected. So you have a bias, and you need to reduce that bias. And we have built some models that do that for us. And overall, we make better predictions, meaning we have a higher return on investment. I'm doing a PhD at the moment. Um, and when doing PhD, it's very important to publish. Publishing papers in conferences or journals, and that's fun. We also um, appeared in the New Scientist. New Scientist is a big science magazine, and they had a story about us last year. And uh, McKinsey also cited us. They wrote a big study last year about AI and applications of AI to a lot of different fields. And they also had a section on electricity or smart grids, and we were cited in there too. And I've published a lot of papers, which is very important when being in academia. But finally, we have an industry partner. And the industry partner says, yeah, you can publish, but we don't get much out of it. When you work with an industry partner in academia, or when you're in academia and you work with an industry partner, you also have to deliver. You have to deliver real results. And our industry partner is happy, and they are using that stuff in production that we derive new models. They use them in production. And finally, my models generate more money, uh, more revenue, more profit, and the utilities have a higher return on investment when carrying out inspections, reducing, therefore, the overall losses. So that's what I'm working on. Uh, if you speak German and you're interested in this topic, um, we have just published a book on innovation in German a few months ago, and I have written a chapter about AI, and uh, about innovation using AI, and uh, you're welcome to read this book and that chapter. If you remember Kathleen, who is the uh, host on the first stage, she also contributed a chapter to this book. Uh, so the book is all about innovation, um, and I can highly recommend it. And that's how I also came here, because I met Kathleen through this book, and she invited me to come here today and speak to you. Um, I'm finishing my PhD in about three or four months, and I'm also doing an MBA in parallel. I'm finishing that next month, so I'm busy like hell. But um, I want to combine basically business with research. And I'm very interested in keeping in touch with you on LinkedIn or whatever. So feel free to send me a LinkedIn request if uh, you have questions on AI or smart grids or electricity theft and so forth. Thank you very much.